Hello everyone and welcome back to Victoria 3's weekly update where today we have some pretty dang exciting news that a lot of you will be pretty keen to hear about and that is military improvements coming to Victoria 3. So with our YouTube housekeeping out of the way, let's not dilly dally, let's jump straight in and talk about the military improvements that we can expect. There are five improvements that they're making to the military in Victoria 3, and of course we're going to break them down one by one, starting with a relatively simple one, and then we'll work our way through to maybe some of the more complex. Uh, here we're talking about battle condition changes, the conditions of the fight that you're going into. Now, what they've done here is made it so that during battles, ongoing ones, there's now a new chance that battle conditions can be re-rolled multiple times throughout the course of any battle. When the condition is re-rolled, there's a 10-day waiting period before the chance for it to re-roll again, although of course note it may not. After 10 days, each tick, which we talked about last week, will increase the chance of the battle condition changing by 2%. So, you should expect it to happen eventually because it will be ticking up and increasingly likely as time passes. That of course will repeat until the battle itself is over. The example that they give is the careful maneuver battle condition which one side is receiving giving them a minus 10% morale loss and a minus 10% casualties taken. Of course these can be positive or negative so it will add a little bit more variety to battles in Victoria 3. The second suite of changes are command script changes, but don't yawn, these ones are actually pretty exciting. Uh, the theory here is that they want to remove some of the randomness that is uh, currently existing inside of battles in Victoria 3, and that could be anything from the game choosing just the wrong general to send in with the wrong promotion, maybe the amount of troops that are being allocated to the battle, or the selection process for the different provinces that will be attacked. These have all been looked at. On the topic of generals, they go on to say that there are now more factors in considering the selection process for which general will be led into the battle as the advancement bar goes up. Generals that have those specific traits that I was just mentioning before, such as defense or offense, now have an increased chance of actually being selected to do their job. Uh, it'll make it less likely that a general with, say, the expert defense strategist trait will lead an offensive battle. Troop selection will also be a little bit more specific here too. If one general, for example, has more modern troops as their base production methods, then that general and those units should have a higher chance of being selected to be sent into battle. Uh, speaking of battles, the size of battles used to be determined uh, primarily by the infrastructure of the state that the battle was within. After that, the game would then compare the average offense and defensive values of both sides, potentially boosting the numerical advantage of the side with inferior troops to help compensate. Uh, these were the main determining factors, they say, for bringing more troops to a battle. What they've done now is revamped the script to make it so that these checks feel a little bit more impactful so that you can actually have troops on the front line. After the game selects the province, as we talked about before, the script then goes through a number of other checks to determine the size of the battle, such as start with the total number of battalions on the front, subtract a random number of battalions proportional to the length of the front, cap by force limit determined by the battle province's infrastructure and the combat width, and lastly, not to bore you too much with the detail, also increase the side with the most battalions by a random value, proportional to their relative advantage. These battles are of course taking place in those provinces, and province selection was also a little bit of an issue, and it ties in with our next point as well, one of the big gameplay changes to Victoria 3, allowing us to actually assign strategic objectives to front lines and battle plans so that we can surge towards what we actually want to capture. Uh, they've added a more reliable way of measuring the distance to either the closest strategic objective that you'll be setting, or alternatively your war goals that you set at the start. The game scores provinces higher the closer they are to you. Now that all makes a lot of sense to me, although granted talking about the script we did get into the detail, so let's take a quick break. And today's quick break is an announcement of an announcement live stream, Paradox on March 6th at 6pm 6 CET, are hosting a live stream where they'll be revealing three new games as well as expansions and updates to their existing wonderful library of strategy, grand strategy and simulation games. I'll be sure to provide some coverage on it if there are some spicy updates, and now let's get back to the video with our strategic objectives. And, and as I mentioned earlier, these are the big sort of changes that you'll feel in the gameplay, although our fifth point should also bring through a 
lot of quality of life improvements to the military, but more on that in a little bit. Uh, of course, we have talked about the strategic objectives before. As they mention in the dev diary, they've hinted at it a little bit already. Uh, strategic objectives are, of course, a way for us to actually control the direction in which a front advances, right? You right click, send the arrow over that way, and hopefully blitzkrieg towards your target. Uh, we can now, of course, target a state per theatre for generals to attack towards. So we have a bit more flexibility with it now. And they did hint in a previous developer diary that they would like to see a bit more flexibility, more options, more strategic objectives, and a bit more control for us. And maybe this is that coming through. Uh, ultimately, of course, this is to allow us to keep the state targeted under our control. And so if control is lost in that state, well, subsequent battles will target it again. The idea is you're really pushing for what you want to achieve other than, you know, what it was, which was kind of just throwing things at the front line. And as we discussed earlier with the changes that have removed a lot of the randomness, it, seemingly it was just throwing things somewhat randomly. So it's nice that they've removed a lot of those controls at the back, which were somewhat random, the assignment of generals, for example. And of course, we have this new strategic objective control as well. War exhaustion changes are next on the list. And as they mentioned, we did talk about this a little bit two weeks ago in my main update. But these are really important changes that help to essentially provide the suite of military improvements that they're doing. Uh, war exhaustion previously and in the previous patch basically wasn't working the way that they intended or that they enjoyed, as they say. Uh, basically, you could take a small amount of land, hold it until the war was over, and the ticking over of war exhaustion would lead in your favour. The naval invade Berlin strategy. They wanted to shift it so that casualties would have a higher impact on the war itself, and to that end, they've increased the impact of war exhaustion for casualties and decreased the amount of exhaustion for taking a small amount of land. And as we discussed previously, of course, don't forget that this varies a little bit depending on the size of your state and the significance significance of that land. A big state like Russia mightn't mind so much if it loses some of its hinterland, whereas a small nation, that will have a much larger impact on them. The final section, and not to be overlooked, is the miscellaneous quality of life changes that have appeared. Changes to the equipment adjustment modifier for military buildings, better information regarding the selection of units, and stopping reinforcements from joining during an active battle. <laughs> Starting with the equipment adjustment modifier for the military buildings, when you switch production, right? So let's say you've been using cannon artillery, now you've unlocked mobile artillery, and it's time to swap it out into your units. That modifier has been increased from 75% to 80%, but there is now a second modifier at play for all the secondary production method groups. The modifier is only a 20% reduction in offense and defense of your units. So we have a minor but still 20% impact playing out on our units and then a much more significant one on the production method side. If, for example, you swap out a primary and secondary production method at the same time, then you'll get your 100%. Some other minor changes that were added in here for quality of life now at the, well, actually during ongoing battles in the battle tab, next to the start of the battle number of soldiers, there's now an information icon that allows us to see how the size of the battle is being determined. Remember we talked a bit about the determination for sizes of battles earlier in the video. They've also included a tracker for the amount of men that have been demoralized in the battle or are no longer able to participate. Useful information to have at hand. And finally, the last change that they added to battles is that battalions currently engaged in battle will never be reinforced by their barracks hiring new soldiers. New manpower generated for the new servicemen will join the battalions only after they have detached from the battle. This could frequently lead to battles lasting forever previously as both sides would just keep cycling in more and more troops effectively making the front unable to move. And that's all of the changes that we'll be discussing today for the military. Not of course an overarching wide sweeping new system but personally I think some fairly solid changes. I can't really fault any of them and I look forward to seeing how they play out in game. Now, finally, let's talk about next steps, when, where, how. So, of course, these changes are being rolled out at the moment actively in the 1.2 beta. The beta is coming to an end, and as they mention at the end of the developer's diary, next week we're going to receive the full patch notes for patch 1.2. The thing that we've been discussing now for three weeks on the channel, and frankly, honestly, I'm fairly stoked with it. Granted, we're still early in the game, and there's definitely still more work to do, especially in a paradox life cycle. 
but I consider patch 1.2 to probably be the best one so far. I'm really looking forward to sinking my teeth into the patch notes next week. Be sure to subscribe to help us get towards 50k, and I'll see you then. Take care, everybody.